Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing thrombosis and antithrombotic drugs. Okay, so in this video we're going to actually turn our attention now to antithrombotic drugs. So we've seen what thrombosis now is, and we're going to see how the antithrombotic drugs target the um, thrombotic pathways or the hemostatic pathways. After all, thrombosis is just hemostasis occurring in a blood vessel where you don't actually have a hole in the side of it. Okay, so we'll start off with drugs which can be used for clot lysis. Okay, so if you actually have a uh, thrombus within your blood, uh, then you can use certain drugs. There are certain drugs uh, which can be used to destroy that thrombus. Okay, so they're often given to people who, have s who are suffering from occlusive strokes. If it is believed that the thrombus might still be present uh, within the blood vessel and therefore still blocking the blood vessel to a certain portion of the brain, uh, then often these drugs will be given. Okay, so, if we've got someone suffering from the occlusive stroke, and there's actually an important point here, that there are two major types of stroke. The sort that I have described to you is what's known as an occlusive stroke, where you have uh, a thrombus, or a, potentially a thromboembolus, blocking a blood vessel that supplies a portion of the brain, and that leads to the ischemia of that portion of the brain, and uh, the death, potentially, of that portion of the brain. That's known as an occlusive stroke. There's another rarer form of stroke, known as hemorrhagic stroke, okay? And in hemorrhagic stroke, what happens is that a blood vessel effectively bursts open within the brain, so you get bleeding within the brain, and that, again, uh, leads to uh, certain portions of the brain not having blood delivered to them, because if a blood vessel has burst open, uh, then it's not going to be supplying blood to wherever it was meant to. Instead, the blood's all going to be gushing out where the hole is, basically. Okay, now hemorrhagic strokes, uh, generally, they happen in younger people, generally, whereas occlusive strokes generally happen in older people. I think the statistic is generally 15% of strokes are hemorrhagic strokes, and 85% are occlusive strokes. Okay, and... Um, the only uh, risk factor that I know for hemorrhagic stroke is that if you have too high blood pressure, that's what can cause blood vessels within the brain to start bursting open. And specifically, it's um, associated with the use of certain psychostimulants, such as cocaine and amphetamines. Okay, so these drugs both produce a very high um, rise in blood pressure. Uh, because they cause the release of noradrenaline from all the neurons which innervate the smooth muscle cells, and that causes the contraction of the smooth muscle cells. Okay, so they cause a hefty rise in blood pressure, and that can lead to hemorrhagic stroke. Okay, right. Um, so, why have I mentioned this? Well, basically, y you do not want to give the drugs that I have that I'm about to tell you about, you do not want to give them to people suffering from hemorrhagic strokes. So usually they do some sort of a scan um, uh, before they would ever give this drug um, to make sure that it's not a hemorrhagic stroke that the person is suffering from. Because if you give someone with a hemorrhagic stroke the drugs that I'm about to tell you, it will make it worse whereas it will make it better in the case of the occlusive stroke. It's kind of like uh, diabetes, where there are these three different types of, um, well, three different types of crisis that you can go into, and if you give the wrong therapy to them, it will kill each of the different ones, whereas it will save one of them. Anyway, uh, so uh, let's discuss these drugs then. So uh, one of the drugs is known as streptokinase, okay? And this is produced by certain species of streptococci, okay? So, for instance, streptococci, um, oh, sorry, streptococcus pyogenes produces streptokinase. Okay, so what does streptokinase do? Well, basically, it causes the activation of um, an um, enzyme which is within the blood. So, within the blood, there is a precursor enzyme which is, again, synthesized by the liver which is known as plasminogen, okay? And plasminogen can be converted to the active enzyme plasmin, 
okay? And what plasmin does is it breaks down fibrin strands. So it will take a fibrin strand, okay? And it will break it down into many pieces. So let me show this. So here's a fibrin strand here, and we'll have this in red. And basically what plasmin will do is it will break that fibrin strand into loads of pieces which are just collectively known as fibrin degradation products. Okay, so when plasminogen is activated to plasmin, it's going to start breaking down fibrin strands into loads of little pieces known as fibrin degradation products. Now, we know that fibrin strands are an extremely important part of holding together a hemostatic plug, and they're also an extremely important part of holding together a thrombus. So if plasmin starts breaking down the fibrin strands within a thrombus, so if we draw our little thrombus here, okay, then let's draw the fibrin strands in amongst them. So here are the fibrin strands intertwining everything together. If you break apart the fibrin strands, let's say you're cutting all of this up, then what's going to happen is the whole thing is going to be break apart, well, is, is going to break apart. So basically this is a way of breaking uh, thrombuses up into pieces, basically, uh, disintegrating thrombi. Okay, so let me highlight this up. So here are the fibrin degradation products, and obviously once the fibrin meshwork is no longer holding the platelets together, the platelet uh, aggregation bonds are too weak to keep everything together, so it all just falls apart. Okay, so by activating plasmino plasminogen to plasmin, you can break apart um, uh, from by. Okay, now this is one of the usual ways that the body has of preventing thrombi from forming in a blood vessel because on the surface of happy, healthy endothelial cells, so let's say we've got an endothelial cell here, you have two enzymes, okay, so I'll draw these two enzymes, one here and one here, and these enzymes are called tissue plasminogen activator, so I'll call this tissue plasminogen activator, which is often abbreviated to TPA for short. So tissue plasminogen activator. Okay, so this is abbreviated to T, and then you put a dash PA. Now, uh, this other enzyme is an enzyme known as urokinase. Okay? And urokinase is often also called urokinase plasminogen activator, and therefore is often abbreviated to UPA. So you have TPA and UPA, which are tissue plasminogen activator and urokinase plasminogen activator, respectively. And both of these enzymes, which are on the surface of these endothelial cells, will continuously be activating the plasminogen which the liver is producing and sending into the bloodstream into plasmin. And if there is any fab fibrin strands forming within the blood, the plasmin will then break it down. Now, if you've got a thrombus in, let's say, some blood vessel in the brain, what you can then do is give streptokinase and streptokinase also activates plasminogen into plasmin. So if you give streptokinase to someone who is suffering from an occlusive stroke, what will happen is it will convert the plasminogen within the blood into plasmin, and plasmin will start to degrade fibrin strands into fibrin degradation products. And where you've got the thrombus, or potentially a thromboembolus, uh, that thrombus will be broken down into pieces, just like I've shown here, basically. And therefore, you will dissolve the, um, the uh, occlusion in the blood vessel, and blood flow to the affected area of the brain will be restored, and hopefully that will reduce damage. Now, this is excellent in an occlusive stroke, but what will it do in a hemorrhagic stroke? Because in a hemorrhagic stroke, the blood vessel has broken open. So what do you need to happen? You need hemostasis to occur, basically. You need um, the three separate portions of hemostasis to occur. You need uh, the plate, well, actually, I'll describe the whole pathway. You need the platelets to come in and adhere to the um, disturbed endothelial cells. In fact, where are my pictures to show this? Um, here. 
Okay, so you need the platelets to come in and adhere to the disturbed endothelial cells. You then need other platelets to go and find the collagen and the tissue factor which are exposed, undergo activation, set off the chain reaction of activation, lead to a massive increase of thromboxane A2 in the vicinity of the hole. You then That will then cause vasoconstriction of the blood vessel. Okay, it will also cause the platelets to become um, sticky and they'll start to aggregate together. In addition, the exposed collagen and tissue factor will activate uh, the intrinsic and extrinsic coagulation cascade and you'll get fibrinogen being converted to fibrin and then into fibrin strands and these fibrin strands will be being formed in the same place as we're forming this um, platelet aggregate so you'll get fibrin strands deposited amongst the platelets and this will form a meshwork that will hold the whole thing together and plug that hole in the side of the blood vessel and stop the hemorrhage. If you now give streptokinase, streptokinase will activate um, plasminogen to plasmin and plasmin will break down the fibrin here and when you've broken down all the fibrin the platelets can't really form a strong plug on their own so uh, they'll give way and the blood will just continue to come out of the uh, hole in the side of the blood vessel so you'll promote hemorrhage in hemorrhagic stroke if you give streptokinase to someone suffering from hemorrhagic stroke so this is why streptokinase I think generally has to be um, signed off by a consultant who has decided you know that this is most definitely an occlusive stroke and they generally do scans before they will ever prescribe streptokinase to someone in case the stroke is due to a hemorrhagic stroke rather than an occlusive stroke. Okay, so uh, we'll now discuss another modified form of streptokinase. So there is a drug known as anisotropase. Okay, so anisotropase. Now anisotropase is actually a combination of two um, two drugs basically. You have plasminogen in anisotropase. So anisotropase contains plasminogen, okay, and it also contains streptokinase, but the streptokinase is not activated yet, okay. So streptokinase. Oh, and by the way, I should have said this. The strep streptokinase will be delivered uh, intravenously, basically. It would be an intravenous injection rather than orally taken or anything like that. Same with anisotropase. So anisotropase is a mixture of plasminogen with streptokinase, which has been anisoilated. So let me explain this. So you would call this anisoilated streptokinase. So basically, what you have done is you've stuck anisoil groups, which is a molecular group, into the active site of the streptokinase, so that the streptokinase cannot function yet. Okay? So when the streptokinase has this anisoil group uh, bound to it, okay, so I'll just draw a picture of this. So let's say this is our streptokinase enzyme here. Okay? And this little cleft here is the active site. Basically, what we've stuck on is some sort of molecular group known as an anisoil group. Okay, and this group is stuck in the active site of the enzyme. Okay, so it makes the enzyme inactive until the anisoil group has been uh, removed, basically. Now, um, this is fortunate because the anisotropase contains both plasminogen and this anisoilated streptokinase. So if the streptokinase wasn't anisoilated, i.e. it wasn't inactivated, it would be converting the plasminogen into the plasmin long before you'd ever actually given the drug. As it is, what will happen is when the anisoilated streptokinase goes into the plasma, when you've injected it in, what will happen is this anisoil group will be removed and then um, the streptokinase enzyme will now be functional and it will convert the plasminogen that you put in as well uh, as uh, along with the plasminogen that's naturally within the blood it will convert both of them into plasmin so you'll get a larger increase in plasmin than if you just give streptokinase alone basically and then this plasmin will degrade the fibrin strands into fibrin degradation products and the clot will be lysed okay so I might just put that terminology here 
this is known as clot lysis okay when you break down a, a thrombus or maybe thrombus lysis would be more uh, accurate because clot um, could mean a hemostatic plug or a thrombosis for sorry a thrombus as we've discussed previously okay so we'll continue this discussion of anti-thrombotic drugs in the next video